like gases and liquids, the properties of solids can also be explained using the kinetic molecular theory. Solids are much more closely packed than liquids or gases, and usually we describe them as having a definite shape and a definite volume. The reason this occurs is because the intermolecular forces between the particles are stronger and hold the particles into a relatively fixed position. So the particles can't flow, but rather they vibrate against each other. Because the particles of a solid are more closely packed together, solids have a higher density than both liquids and gases. This also makes them incompressible. And because the particles aren't able to flow past each other, solids have an extremely low rate of diffusion. Solids can undergo melting. Melting is the change of a solid to a liquid by the addition of heat energy. And the temperature at which the solid changes to a liquid is called its melting point. In terms of the kinetic molecular theory, the melting point occurs when the kinetic energy of the particles overcomes the intermolecular forces between them and allows the particles to move from that fixed solid arrangement to the random configuration of particles that is found in liquids. There are two main types of solids. There are crystalline solids and there are amorphous solids. Crystalline solids exist in a regular repeating three-dimensional pattern called a crystal. The particles of a crystal are organized into a crystal lattice structure. We learned about lattice structures when we talked about chemical bonding, and I'll show you an example of a crystal lattice on another slide. When the crystal lattice forms, the particles arrange themselves so that they have the lowest amount of potential energy, and this creates a very stable arrangement. The arrangement of the crystal lattice particles determines the shape of the crystal. For example, in the two pictures to the right, the top crystal has sort of a hexagonal arrangement, whereas the bottom crystal is a cubic arrangement. Regardless of their crystal lattice shape, all crystalline solids have a definite melting point. If you take a crystal and zoom in to look at the individual particles, the smallest portion of that crystal that shows that three-dimensional pattern of the entire lattice is called the unit cell. You can see in the picture at the bottom that there is a box of particles that is outlined in blue. That's the example of the unit cell, and then that unit cell repeats over and over and over in an organized pattern that ends up creating the entire shape of the crystal. There are actually seven different types of unit cells, such as the cubic or the hexagonal that was shown on the previous slide. All crystalline solids can be subdivided into four different types depending on the particles and the bonds that form between them. We mentioned these four different types of binding forces when we talked about chemical bonding, but we'll explore them in a little bit more detail here. The first type are ionic crystals, and this occurs when there is an attraction between oppositely charged ions. Normally we call ionic crystals salts. For example, lithium chloride forms a cubic lattice structure and therefore forms cube-shaped crystals. A second type of crystalline solid is a covalent network crystal. And this occurs when there are actually covalent bonds that attach neighboring atoms together. Some examples of covalent network crystals include diamonds. If you looked at the carbon atoms that make up a diamond, you would see that they are all connected together with covalent bonds and arranged in kind of a tetrahedral pattern that gives diamonds their incredible hardness. Sand is also an example of a covalent network crystal, but here the covalent bonds occur between silicon atoms and oxygen atoms. And the graphite that you use in pencils is also a network crystal of carbon atoms, but different than the diamond, the carbon atoms are arranged in sheets, and these sheets can easily slide past each other which makes graphite ideal for writing with. A third type of binding force is called a metallic crystal. This is the same as the arrangement in metallic bonding, where we have a sea of electrons that can flow in and around all of the different metal cations of that crystal. And the last type of binding force is called a covalent molecular crystal. This one occurs when covalently bonded molecules are held together by intermolecular forces. Now don't get a covalent molecular crystal and a covalent network crystal confused. In the network crystal, the atoms are held together by covalent bonds, but in the molecular crystal, the atoms are held together by intermolecular forces. 
This would be the same type of attractive force that holds water molecules together in a solid form called ice. So to review, crystalline solids can be subdivided into four different kinds, ionic, covalent network, metallic, and covalent molecular. The other type of solid is called an amorphous solid. Unlike the particles of a crystal, where the order has a very predictable repeating pattern, the particles of an amorphous solid are arranged randomly. Amorphous solids include things like wax, glass, and plastics. All of these substances have no distinct geometric shape, and you can mold them into any shape that you want. Because they don't have a distinct three-dimensional shape, they have no definite melting point. And so amorphous solids will actually melt over a wider range of temperatures than a crystalline solid. People that participate in the art of blowing glass take advantage of this when forming their products. Amorphous solids are sometimes classified as supercooled liquids. And this is because they retain certain liquid properties even at temperatures where they appear to be a solid. The reason they retain these liquid properties is because the particles are arranged randomly, much like the particles of a liquid. But unlike a liquid, the particles of an amorphous solid are not constantly changing their positions. 